In this video, we're going to talk about high flow nasal cannula, specifically in adult patients. So, high flow nasal prongs and nasal cannula come in a variety of trade name forms, which I'm going to try and avoid, but uh, I've become so synonymous with them that it's difficult to. So, some of them like the Evo, the Evo 2, the Vapotherm, and the OptiFlow are some examples of devices that provide high flow nasal oxygen. <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about those today. So let's just start by some of the ways that we can give oxygen therapy to a patient. Because we're going to use these to contrast them to high flow nasal oxygen. So we can give people regular nasal prongs and this is probably the most common way that we give people oxygen in the hospital. This is some oxygen tubing, it's usually plastic, it uh, hooks up to an oxygen flow meter on the wall and we turn up the flow of oxygen and 100% oxygen comes out of those little nasal um, cannula that go is, goes into the patient's nostrils. The difference is, is that the flow rate is very low. So we usually run these nasal prongs somewhere between one and five liters a minute. So that 100% oxygen that's coming out of the nasal prong gets diluted by the rest of the gas that the patient breathes in when they take a breath in. And that, and that mixing of the very small amount of 100% oxygen with the lots of regular air from the room that the patient's in mixes down to give you a, a, an approximate FiO2. And that's how nasal oxygen works. Similar with face masks, and these are what we call low flow devices. You can also give oxygen through a couple of other face masks. A common one being a Venturi mask, which we might talk about in other videos, some of the specifics of these devices. But Venturi masks use fixed entrainment um, ratios based on the degree of um, the obstruction to the gas flow going through the Venturi disc. And these provide a little bit more of a precise FiO2 to the patient. Um, that doesn't vary as much with the patient's inspiratory flows. Non rebreathers are sort of reservoir devices that has a mask with then a reservoir bag attached to the bottom that fills with 100% oxygen so that when the patient sucks in or entrains that extra air from the environment, they, they suck that in from the reservoir bag that's got lots of oxygen in it rather than from the room. So that allows these masks to give uh, a lot more oxygen than some of these other ones. These are often called 100% non rebreathers, which is a misnomer. They don't provide 100% oxygen, but they do provide a very high FiO2 and they are good in emergencies. Finally, well, we can talk about ventilators. This is obviously an, another way of giving oxygen to a patient. It's a bit more extreme, and that can either be done through invasive ventilation that re re would require an endotracheal tube or through non invasive ventilation. This is that. BiPAP or those BiPAP masks that we see patients on. So how does high flow nasal cannulas fit into this sort of spectrum of oxygen therapy devices? So these high flow nasal cannulas and these again some of those those companies that make them, um, they're slightly different in that the flow and the FiO2 aren't as closely connected as you would be with nasal prongs or a regular face mask. On a high flow nasal cannula device, you set a flow rate and you set an FiO2. So I can choose, usually these devices give somewhere between 5 and 60 liters a minute, which is quite a lot of flow going through someone's nose. And then you can pick your FiO2 and the device will use a blender system to allow you to deliver 40 liters a minute with a FiO2 of 21. Uh, 21 percent you can give 10 liters a minute on 100 percent so you can choose both your flow rate and your FiO2. Now the the RTs among you who actually set this up and sh and set this up on patients will note that on some of these devices these there isn't that separation that I'm talking about it's not quite as separated as I'm alluding to adjusting your FiO2 and adjusting your flow rates can manipulate these what I'm saying is that it's possible to independently control your flow rate and your FiO2. Um, one of the major selling points and major big points of these devices is that they're heated and that they're humidified to a far better extent than some of these other oxygen therapy devices. For example, nasal prongs, you can, you can put a nasal prong um, oxygen through a bubble humidifier and it'll pick up a little bit of humidity, which might help overcome some of the sort of dryness, nasal dryness patients experience. But when you get up to flows of 60 liters a minute, you, if you don't heat and humidify that gas, it's really gonna dry out the patient's mucosa. And they're gonna use a fair amount of energy to heat that gas as it goes through their upper airway. So heated humidified gas is a major factor in, in, um, in high flow nasal cannula.
So what type of patients might we use this on and, and how logistically do we set this up on people? So we'll get to sort of some of the evidence behind high flow nasal oxygen in a minute, but there are a number of situations in which high flow nasal cannula and high flow nasal oxygen have been successful. So lots of different situations, um, certainly in the peri-intubation period, so pre-intubation, post-extubation, post-op patients can benefit from this. Both medical and surgical patients have been shown to get some improvement from this. But predominantly, and this is kind of a key point, this is for mostly for hypoxemic patients. This is very good at correcting hypoxemia. It is not quite as good at correcting hypercapnia. So if this, if you have a patient in hypercapnic respiratory failure, they don't tend to do as well on high flow nasal oxygen devices as hypoxemic patients do. So then logistically speaking, how do you set this up? So usually you have, you'll have the help of an RT or someone else who's trained in how to use these devices. It certainly shouldn't just be used by everybody without training. Um, but we typically start with a, a relatively conservative flow rate, somewhere between 20 and 35 liters a minute. And this is certainly by no means dogma. You can, you can choose to do this however your institution has sort of become comfortable with, but this is a reasonable starting point. You start at 20 to 35 liters a minute, and you're gonna titrate that to the patient's work of breathing, to their respiratory rate and how they look. And we typically start with the flows around here. Really, then you can titrate your FiO2 using that blending device to get you to whatever SpO2 goal that you're looking for. Um, and what you can often find is that as you start to increase their flow rates and get this up to 40, 45, 50 liters a minute, you can often turn down your FiO2 because the flow rate allows them to, to be a bit more efficient and they don't require as much oxygen. That's anecdotal, but you'll see that as you put patients on this. And then you're going to want to monitor patients. There's a little bit of sort of a debate around where these patients should be in the hospital. Um, my take on this, and certainly this is just my opinion, is that really the, the sickness of the patient should di dictate where in the hospital they go, whether they go to a regular floor or an IMCU or an ICU, should be how sick the patient is, not simply by being on a high flow nasal oxygen device. You can run someone on 50 liters a minute for their work of breathing and have them on room air. And no one would suggest that a patient on room air has to go to an IMCU. So really, you need to use your clinical judgment in terms of where these patients need to go. But they do need to be monitored in some way. So let's talk a little bit about some of the mechanisms of how high flow nasal oxygen is helpful and why it helps people. <clears throat> so there's a few that have come up in the literature a reasonable amount. And some of them are fairly straightforward, like there's relatively soft, pliable prongs on these things, and they make a relatively snug kind of fit in the patient's nose, which A, helps with patient comfort because they're softer than regular prongs, and it also helps make a little bit of a seal in the patient's nose, which reduces entrainment and makes them a bit more efficient. The fact that the gas is warmed and humidified is a big deal. That allows... It reduces patients' work of breathing to have warmed gas and humidified gas. And it prevents some of the sort of nasal and upper airway dryness that you would get if you didn't humidify, if you didn't humidify this gas. Your rates of epistaxis would be pretty high if this was dry, unwarmed gas that you were putting into someone at 60 liters a minute. So these two both improve comfort quite a bit. The idea of dead space washout comes up quite a lot. And really this is just kind of the notion that Putting really high flows of oxygen or gas into the patient's upper airway flushes out that sort of anatomic dead space in the upper airway, certainly in the sort of naso oropharynx and potentially down into sort of some of the, the lower airway into the trachea and mainstem bronchi as well. Again, not a lot of sort of robust evidence base behind that, but it's kind of intuitive that putting a huge amount of flow into someone's face is going to kind of flush out some of that dead space. And what that does is it allows that dead space to be filled with nicely oxygenated fresh gas flow versus the exhaled gas that they just exhaled from their previous breath out. So this kind of helps improve the efficiency of their breathing and reduces work of breathing as well. So I kind of breeze through these top three. These bottom two need a little bit more discussion. So the high flow rates I'll start with because that's probably one of the key things for, for this type of device. So 
and I hate to use graphs, I try and avoid them, but I think this one's relatively helpful. Um, <clears throat> so what we have here is flow on the y-axis and time on the on the x-axis, and it's increasing flow, so inspiratory flow on the top, and then expiratory flow going down. And you can see a blue line here, and that's just at a fixed flow rate of five liters a minute, all right? And that's to simulate our nasal prongs, right? Our nasal oxygen that we've put at five liters a minute. Continuous flow, five liters a minute right across the board. And what you can see is that as the patient takes breaths in and out, these breaths are going to vary in size. The, the flow rate that the patient's generating when they take a breath in and out is going to vary based on how distressed they are. If they're very relaxed, maybe that flow rate will be nice and slow like this first breath. And if they're in distress, that flow rate that they take in is going to be much, much higher like in this second breath. And what you see is that when they have a fixed flow rate that's quite low, the patient actually takes a breath in that exceeds the flow rate of the nasal prongs that you're giving them. So this shaded in area is air that they're entraining in to their lungs, a breath that they're entraining in from the regular room air that they're breathing in from, right? So that they're getting five liters a minute of oxygen, which meets this bit below the blue line. And then every flow, every liter a minute of flow rate above that has to come from somewhere, right? Because it's not coming from the five liters a minute of oxygen. So that's air they're sucking in from the, the, the room around them which dilutes down the FiO2 of the gas that they're getting, which is kind of what we talked about with the nasal prongs at the beginning and how they how they deliver variable amounts of oxygen. So what you get with that is that as you take a faster breath in, like you would do if you're in distress, now a larger proportion of your inspiratory flow is coming from entrained regular air versus the oxygen from your nasal prongs. So your FiO2 is going to kind of fluctuate and be variable based on the patient's inspiratory flow rates. Flow rates. And those are going to change quite a bit when a patient, during a patient's illness. So fixed low flow rates tend to give a very variable level of FiO2 based on how the patient's breathing. I hope that makes sense. Now, when we go to the high flow devices like this 60 liters a minute up here, it's unlikely that a patient, regardless of how in extremis they are, is going to have inspiratory flow rates that go much above 60, which means that if you set this 60 liters a minute and 40% or 80% oxygen, you can pretty much guarantee that the patient's getting exactly that because the flow rate of that device exceeds the inspiratory flow rate that the patient's making even when they're distressed. And that's kind of how by overcoming that flow, you reduce patient's work of breathing and you give a much more um, reliable delivery of oxygen therapy. The next thing that comes up quite a bit when you look at research or you talk to people in the hospital about um, high flow nasal cannulas is they talk about this CPAP effect and people love to talk about PEEP and how they think nasal cannulas give PEEP. And I think it's something we need to be quite careful of. So I'm going to talk you through some of the studies that have come up with that and, and how we can maybe question that and just be cautious when we use that terminology. <clears throat> so this is showing again another graph which is uh, complicated and I apologize but on the y-axis here going up this is pressure in the nasopharynx so nasopharyngeal pressure in centimeters of water and you'll notice that centimeters of water is also the unit that we use for CPAP and PEEP on ventilators and that type of thing conveniently and then this is increasing flow rates on a nasal oxygen cannula and you can see that uh, as you the pressure is going to go up as you exhale right into that incoming flow right the pressure in the nasopharynx will increase as you exhale and that collides with the incoming flow so up is exhalation and then it peaks and then settles out to this like plateau that you can see here and that's what they saw there's this end expiration plateau and then inspiration happens as they take a breath in and it drops down and what they're saying is if you look at 50 liters a minute, that sort of plateau of end expiration is elevated. And they're like, oh, okay, well, this is an elevated end expiratory pressure. So maybe the maybe this is causing PEEP. Maybe this is causing some sort of CPAP, which we can recruit alveoli with and we can treat heart failure with and all the type of things that we use PEEP and CPAP for. And I would just caution you to be a little bit careful because if you, A, look, if you look at this graph, Inspiration here is going to be under negative pressure because they're breathing spontaneously. So firstly, CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. And the positive airway pressure is hardly continuous in this setting. It is dancing all over the place. Um, when they inspire, they're, they're taking a breath in which drops their pressure, which on a ventilator or on a BiPAP machine, 
inspiration would be under positive pressure. Therefore, the stat CPAP or baseline pressure would be the lowest pressure that the patient experiences in the circuit because inspiration is always going to be above their CPAP pressure. Here you have inspiration dropping below, you have it going above. And sure, there's going to be a mean pressure here somewhere, which may be elevated and may provide some sort of level of positive pressure to the patient's airway. So I'm, I'm certainly not disputing what they found, but I would be careful in equating this directly to CPAP or, or PEEP that you get on a ventilator. And lastly, what I'd say is that they're measuring nasopharyngeal pressure in these studies. And yes, that may be a reasonable surrogate for alveolar pressure, which is ultimately what we care about when we're talking about PEEP or CPAP, alveolar distending pressure is what's going to open up atelectatic lung reasons. That's what's going to push pulmonary edema out of the lungs is alveolar pressure, not nasopharyngeal pressure. So making this sort of comparison and then saying that's PEEP, that's going to affect our ability to treat heart failure or oxygenation or atelectasis, I think is a little bit of a stretch. But I'll grant you there probably is some positive pressure that comes from having 50 to 60 liters of oxygen blown into your face. So uh, it's certainly something there, but I would be cautious saying that this is a true PEEP or CPAP. So we tend to call this a, a CPAP effect versus true CPAP. So now let's just move on and briefly talk about some of the evidence, because that's what most people really care about when it comes to these new devices. <clears throat> so some of the things that we care about is oxygenation and comfort. We talked a little bit about that already. And the studies that are out there for that, there's quite a few small trials, some observational trials, and a handful of randomized control trials that look at improved oxygenation and improved comfort. And almost all of them show that that's the case, that patients do have an improvement in their oxygenation and they are more comfortable on this device. So there's a reasonable amount of evidence there for that. But in terms of things that change major outcomes that we care about, which is like preventing intubation, like how many of these people don't get intubated because they were on high flow nasal cannulas? And what is the survival benefit from being this versus something else? So one of the larger trials today is the, was, this is a French ICU study that was published in the New England Journal in 2015. And they looked at high flow nasal cannulas compared to non-invasive ventilation compared to standard oxygen therapy. And they looked at patients who were A, normal capnic, that's a key point here. They had a CO2 of less than or equal to 45. Um, and their PF ratio was less than 300. So these were hypoxemic respiratory failure patients. And what they found is that there was really no difference in the intubation rates between any of these three groups, high flow, nasal cannula, non-invasive, or standard oxygen therapy. Um, but there was a 90-day mortality decrease in the high flow nasal cannula group. But this should be caveated by the fact that this was a secondary outcome measure in this study and the study there was not very many deaths occurred in the study and it was not powered appropriately to detect mortality so this is more really of a trend towards it if anything they then did a subgroup analysis and looked at patients who are more hypoxemic so pf ratio of less than 200 versus 300 and in that subgroup they found that the high flow nasal cannulas did lower intubation rates versus non-invasive and standard oxygen therapy so there's at least something there. There was then a meta-analysis published in the Canadian Medical Journal um, in 2017, and that was in acute hypoxic respiratory failure patients. And they found that high flow nasal cannulas decreased intubation rates versus standard oxygen therapy, like masks and nasal prongs and things, but it didn't have any difference when it was compared to non-invasive ventilation. Okay, so this is by no means an exhaustive literature review, and I encourage you to look at the literature yourself, but those are some of the sort of higher impact trials that have been put out there. What I will say is that there is a lot of research going on into high flow nasal oxygen in all sorts of settings. In the emergency room setting, they're using it as a pre -oxy apneic oxygenation device. There's research going into this in a lot of places, and I think there's going to be more of it coming out in the future. I will just finish briefly with a little bit of caution for using high, these high flow devices. And that is that patients tend to look sort of deceivingly good when, you're, when they're on these high flows. So high flow nasal oxygen can kind of mask some pretty sick people so that it's appropriate to pick the people that you want to monitor and that you think are at risk of de deteriorating because people do tend to, to look quite comfortable whilst they're on these devices, which is obviously great for them. So, for example, somebody who's on 35% oxygen on 40 liters of flow, 
if you took them off and just put them on 35 lead, 35 percent oxygen on a regular oxygen therapy device they're probably going to desaturate there's a good chance they will because th that flow rate is is a significant thing they they really enjoy being on that flow so just some things to be cautious with when you're when you're monitoring patients on high flow oxygen so hopefully this hasn't been too long of a video. This was just to give a brief introduction to high flow nasal oxygen, some of the mechanisms, why it's helpful, and some of the research that's out there at the moment. Thanks very much. See you in the next video.